Okay, so here we are with the proximity sensor example, and that is proximity sensor dot x3d. And uh, what's cool about this one is uh, we're building a HUD uh, heads up display. And a HUD is so called because uh, a piece of geometry will stay on the screen in the same relative place. And even though the navigator might use, uh, even though the user might navigate around the 3D scene and go to different places, look at different angles, the heads up display should stay on the screen at the same relative location. Now, how do we do that? Well, we have a uh, transform that contains the HUD contents. Okay, so that's right there, that transform node. And in this case, we have some text. Uh, and the text itself uh, has a uh, default message giving a position. And then down here, there's going to be another text uh, with uh, orientation. And we've got that. Uh, let's see here. There we go. We've got that transform iconized to make it a little simpler. And then we have a script that is going to take the outputs of our proximity sensor and it'll compute, it'll get the position, it'll also get the orientation and then it will compute two text strings. So really it's just a, a type conversion from a number to a string, an MF string. And then it will route those back up to the text nodes. So that goes right there. And this guy goes right here to the orientation text node. And the further thing that happens the, is that uh, so those, those routes right there, we just saw were the text conversion. But we also do some routing from the proximity sensor to the heads up display transform itself. And by routing that value, those same values from the proximity sensor up to the uh, See, where are we? Right there. That says move the text display to the same position as the viewer. Okay? So rather than have that appear right in the viewer, we route the proximity sensor position and rotation for wherever the viewer currently is. And we have a transform near there at the same location, but it will transfer off an offset to where do I want my display to appear on the heads up display. So that means each time the user navigates through the world, the transform that controls where this offset picture is moves with them because the proximity sensor is routing the value around. So let's see if we can't draw that a little more simply. Translation and rotation get routed right there. And then here are our offsets underneath that HUD transform. Those offsets position the text display appropriately. Okay, and uh, what else do we have on the screen here? We have a picture of the uh, script node that does that conversion. 
So let's see if we can make this thing work now. Okay, here is X3D Edit, and it looks pretty grim. Okay, uh, Jeff, we're going to have to record that piece separately, I think, okay. and stick it in. So, uh, let's go ahead with the next chunk of material, and, uh, and then, because I'm concerned we might time it out. Now we'll give it one more shot here, we'll see if we can't get it to respond. To, uh, if it doesn't work, we might want to try just shutting down the recorder for the second. Uh, I'm, I'm not thinking it's that anymore. I think that the, the XJ3D is too delicate and it either works the first time or it goes into a death spiral and it's not coming back. So, uh, this is hard to see, but I'm not going to resize it. See if I can also uh, get it running separately. That's more completely useless exceptions from XJ3D. Thanks, boys. <laughs> Thanks for rejecting all of those bug reports. You know. <laughs> Bugs, who needs it? Well, good Canadians need to be closer friends. Why is XGD being so unstable with uh, some new updates that they put in? Or? Uh, it's been flaky for a while. I've had some really good success with uh, instant reality on right now. No, instant reality is good. So there's something wrong on the scene. It's crashing uh, instant reality too. But Okay, so here we are in the scene, and I'm going to start navigating, and I'm driving forward right now, and then I stop, and you can see while I'm driving forward, and then stop that our position is changing. If I now start dragging to the side, you can see the position and the orientation is changing. So far I've just oriented left and right. Uh, 
uh, because of my navigation mode and because of uh, um, just the way I'm dragging. So it's still about the y-axis. But now if I change my navigation mode to examine and start dragging, you can see that we'll get all sorts of orientation values. And this is slightly jerky. It's jumping around a little bit. It should be perfectly smooth. I call that a bug in the browser, but uh, nevertheless, it's staying right with us as we move around in the scene. If we look at the uh, glue code, what glues it together underneath the hood, here's the script that we uh, just traced with all the routes, and what is that script doing? Well, let's look at it. We've got a script node with four fields. And those four fields are the uh, position and orientation are the inputs. And position converted to text and orientation converted to text are the outputs. If we want to look at uh, what the script does that converts that, I'll highlight it here. And we'll expose the rest of that editor. Let's bring that down. And here we go. It gives us the option to either edit the URL, don't need to do that, it's just fine, or uh, we can load it, load it in extra yet. Sure, well there's a convenient way to find it. So, okay, so here is our script, and we can see that sure enough, it's taking a value, and the input value for each is what's getting routed in, and then uh, the output is uh, what it sends when it sends its, uh, its own name. So let's take a look at this guy now. Function position. We could get a little more verbose here, and I think we should. Let's change value here to position value. And change that. Notice the highlighting is underlying in gray saying, hey, I never used that. Why not? Okay, yeah, let's use it. Let's change these guys. Position value. And then... Uh, Similarly, we'll change value here to orientation value. I could do global search and replace as well, but uh, since there were overloaded variable names, the same variable was doing different things in different places. I think this is a little clearer, and I don't have to worry about global search and replace doing the wrong things. Um, uh, and then here, uh, let's call it Val and Precision. This is a close enough name. Okay, and we traced that in the last session. So now let's, uh, what else do we want to do? Ah, yes, I want to put some comments in here, some documentation for where it is. So I just clicked on the button to launch a new, to open up a new JavaScript template. And so uh, let's look at that. Here we go. We'll copy that. And there's a nice header, nice convenient header for us. And we'll put that right at the beginning. And uh, Actually, I think I'll put it right after the ECMAScript declaration. And the purpose of this is type conversion of position and orientation values to MF string. Okay, and the name of this guy is ConvertText.js, and Leonard was the primary author on this. And let's get our location here. Chapter 12 environment.
Okay, and when was this created? Well, probably about the same time as the original file. So let's go back to Proximity Sensor and say, well, that was created 15 July. of 2006. So we updated it today, which is the 30th of October 2008. And I don't think we need any of these references. They're helpful if you're studying more about scripts that don't really pertain too much to this example. And then our license, uh, we only have to go up one directory to find that here. Okay. So we'll save that guy, and let's see what else we can do here. Notice how in JavaScript and ECMAScript you don't have to declare all your variables. That can be very helpful, it's certainly easier, but you do have to be very careful to use the same variable name uh, that you declare. So this is where the color coding of having the JavaScript in its own window here is particularly important because we can see that the right names were used. If I try to give that a different name, YYY instead, of course the answer to that is I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but that's, that's another story. Um, what did it do? Well, it looks like it let us do it. It uh, didn't holler right there. What if I change it here? YYY. Uh, no joy. So I guess we only get that graying out of an unused variable when it's in the interface. So, moral of the story, be careful out there. Double check, triple check your variables, making sure to see that the numbers are going where they want. What else is happening here? Well, it's taking advantage here of the subscript underscore zero, underscore one, underscore two. That's saying, well, I know my position is a three-tuple array. It's a um, MF vec, excuse me, SF vec 3F. It's a vector of three flows. So that's how we access each of them individually. And our local set digits function simply reformats them to a given value. And then when we create a string, we're just putting it together as a regular string catenation. Here's our default. It says position and then X, uh, although that's a floating point that was just computed, ECMAScript converts that automatically to a string, and that's why we're able to use the plus or the catenate operator and get all those guys to work. Also notice in here that we have uh, a couple of print statements and that they're commented out. Uh, it's very common practice that you use a print statement to trace, to debug things at runtime, make sure it works. Once it is working, I don't recommend you delete all of those. You might need those diagnostics again. It's better to just leave them in place, comment them out, and then you have them if you have to test or try out something different in the future. Okay, what's next here? We should uh, retest it, and then uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that's that works, so I'll test that later. And in the meantime, I'm going to commit them into version control. I don't think I've brought, broken anything. So commit. So we added document metadata comments and uh, clean up, or I would say rename overloaded variables for Clary. Okay, so somebody. Perhaps me, perhaps somebody else looks back later. What the heck did we do to this file? We'll have some footprints there that describe it. Okay, so there we go. We made uh, another example a little bit better. Let's continue on then with our next note. Uh, looks like we have all of our hints and warnings for proximity sensor covered in the tooltips. So we're ready for the next one, visibility sensor. And uh, these are both environmental sensors, sensing what's going on in the environment. Uh, visibility sensor is a little bit different. We check 
not whether or not the viewer's location is inside a box, but rather we check if the viewer is able to see the position in space where that node is located. Okay? And so this tells you whether or not uh, a location in your scene is inside the viewer's view frustum of the camera volume that they're able to detect. Okay, so it, it of course depends then not just on where was my sensor, where was my visibility sensor in space, but also on where is my current user's view, what direction is it pointing in, not only laterally but vertically. Uh, it is not dependent on how far away we are, but rather just the uh, direction it assumes uh, that we're uh, able to see as far as we can go. It doesn't care if we're moving towards or away. It's just doing an intersection of that view frustum and the position to see where it goes. Okay, similar types of fields. So this should not be a surprise, these guys. We've got our center and size uh, of the visibility region, uh, whether it's enabled, is active, gets sent when uh, it's visible, and enter time and exit time are named the same, maybe a little awkwardly, but we kept consistent for uh, whether the user has entered into, a, a, or correction, whether the visibility volume has entered into the view frustum of the uh, viewer's camera. Okay, how do you use it? Once again, it's a good trigger, trigger node. And uh, occasionally you might use it uh, to output uh, text on the screen as a, as a diagnostic or text to the console as another diagnostic. Um, so that trigger can also itself just be an output. Okay? So I guess uh, here's an example we don't have yet. Maybe one of you folks wants to write it. Uh, 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 if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to see it, does it make a sound? Oh, well, this would be one of your notes to put that together when the tree falls. And uh, um, the answer to that question, of course, is uh, it depends. All right, well, the physicist might, I guess, would disagree with me that they would assert that it does make a sound. But how do we measure it then? Well, since this is uh, closer to virtual than reality, you get to decide, as a scene author, exactly what happens. The motivators for including visibility sensors as triggers, as controllers for our animation chain, are, are similar to before. We want to eliminate unnecessary animation to keep our scenes simple, efficient, scalable. And we also want to uh, cue things at the right time. Uh, are, are we allowed to tell jokes on camera? Jeff, should we should we try one? Okay. So here's an example of uh, why timing is important in visibility sensor. That timing, the ability to control timing is very valuable. And the way the way this joke, I I, I only am relating this for experimental purposes here in class to illustrate the material, not please don't ever tell this in front of other people, it would, it would be very embarrassing. But, but the, the way this one works is uh, uh, it's not just me talking, it, it, it's, it's sort of a, a two-way joke. So the way it works is you ask two questions and I'll answer them. And, and the, the two questions are uh, um, what do you do for a living and what makes you so good at it? No. Yeah, so you, you got the question is what do you do for a living and what makes you so good at it? Okay. Don, what do you do for a living? I'm the world's greatest comedian. What makes you so Timing. good? Timing! <laughs> okay, okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for, for doing that. You know, uh, uh, timing is important, and of course, the, the whole reason that joke is important is actually, is, is, has any humor element at all, is you already know the questions. So it's the fact that you're getting interrupted and the word is unexpected and it's all at the same time and it's timing itself. That's, that's, if there is humor to be found, that's where it will be. And
And uh, so is timing important? Sure. It's, uh, it's the essence of these things. So could we use timing appropriately, more appropriately with visibility sensor? Sure. Might you use it to turn off all the joke nodes? Yes, you might, you might do that as well. Okay. So what else? What else? Well, here's an example of how we would use a visibility sensor to turn off or switch out geometry in a scene. And try to get a little fancier on the diagrams here. And uh, we can see we have our vis visibility sensor on the left. And there are the three output variables, output events that it has. And so we'll uh, connect up that first one. And we'll push it off to an integer trigger set boolean. Okay, so uh, this is a boolean output or precisely a single field boolean output and then uh, if set boolean gets a true it will uh, output a negative one. Okay, so that would go to the same switch and give us no geometry. Uh, how would we switch it the other way? Well, here's another integer trigger, and this integer trigger would set a uh, zero. So it would switch it either from no geometry to uh, zero for the initial child geometry. And I guess it's uh, pretty clear we've got a we've got a hole in this diagram because if this visibility sensor triggered as is then it would be doing two things at the same time, and that's bad. So what we really want to do here, I think, is uh, filter the uh, inputs so that we get a, a, a proper negation, and so that we want the uh, true value to trigger our integer trigger to give us geometry. The zero is zero, so this would be true. And up here, we want this guy to trigger on a false. Okay, so what's what's missing from this picture? What do you guys think? If we read the fine point on the trigger note, fry print on the trigger notes, we see that triggers only react to true events. They ignore false events, which is convenient. But our false event, if it's ignored here, would not be doing anything. And the true event would get through and do the wrong thing. So how do we how do we avoid this contrary activity? Fred filter. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Boolean filter. So let's look at Boolean filter and see what we left out here. Go back to our scene. Actually, we'll just start a new scene. And we'll get the palette. And we'll look at our event utilities. Right there. And we'll drag a Boolean filter in and say, what the heck's in there? Okay, that didn't tell us very much, but the help should. So we'll bring up our help on uh, Boolean filter. Oh, now we're in the uh, ever so tedious wait for the help to launch the first time. So I'll bring it up locally. Tooltips, English. This would have been the right time for that music to play. <laughs> Can you cue that again? The uh, the TikTok of the giant huge church bells. The church bells, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the only non-annoying ringtone they have on the iPhone. So yeah, now that they're finally here, they'll both come up at the same time. All right, Boolean filter. Still loading. Boolean 
filter. All right, so set Boolean input, and then the output would be either input true or input false. Okay, so that's how we would keep one or the other from going, but I think what we really want here is the input negate where if it was false, we wanted to instead turn it to true, so it triggers the integer trigger. So let's look at the picture again. So what's missing from this picture goes right here. When we get a false input, we then want it to go to a Boolean filter node. And the output should be the input negate. Okay, and there we go. I think we have a proper wiring diagram now for how would you use a visibility sensor to either switch geometry out of view, meaning negative one on the switch child, or switch the geometry back into view, meaning the viewer is over there, so now we'll look at the real deal. And you might ask, well, wait a minute, why am I doing that again? Why do I need to switch it out of view if I can't even see it? Well, the answer is, you mostly want to switch it into view, perhaps animating it into view, when the user is first there to see it. So, so an exemplar could be a sign that says, comes into the view and says, hey, welcome, so glad to see you, meaning so glad you see me. Why don't you come over here and click this animation or whatever your goal is, okay? So here's the design pattern for that. Visibility sensor, pair of integer triggers, and a switch, and ever so important, a uh, Boolean filter to make sure it does the right thing at the right time. Okay, and that leaves us with our next example, and we'll pick up there.